So uh, I will call this uh, jobs committee to order. Uh, the last piece of business we were on was the A6. Um, uh, I think we were at questions, but I'm told that uh, Representative Mecklen has an amendment. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Mr. Chair, could I move the A3 amendment before? Uh, to, it's an author's sure. amendment and continues to uh, bring the bill in the uh, situation I would prefer. Why don't you move the A3 amendment? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the A3 amendment to the A6DE1 as amended. I'm looking <laughs> at Mr. Reese. Can you no. say that three times fast? <laughs> I'm gonna check. Mr. Reese is a little box in the upper right-hand corner of my screen, and I was waiting for him to shake his head vigorously no, but he didn't. Um, I would like to make sure that that is the correct way to move that this amendment. Uh, so staff, are we good with that, the way he made the motion? We are, we have the, the DE1 in front of us as amended. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have not adopted the DE1 to, to House File 6 yet, or have I? But... Chairing members, I believe we did adopt it. Uh, I have spoken to the revisor, and if you pass the A3, uh, just moving to amend the House File number 6, the delete everything amendment as follows. The revisor and I can make that work. Representative, Representative Dabney, you agree there? I do, happily. So moved. So moved. Please so explain to, your amendment. Mr. Chair, just to, just to make sure we're all on the same page then. So we are on House File 6 as amended, and now we are moving the A3 amendment to House File 6. Just to make sure we're clear and we're all on the same page before we proceed. No. Thank you, Mr. Reese. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, so for members, the House File 6 is part of the Promise Act, which is a, a comprehensive approach to rebuilding the impacted areas from the civil unrest uh, that Minnesota recently experienced. Immediate term, which is what you're seeing with House File 6, more intermediate structures, including a, uh, a master uh, sort of structure for people to come forward. Uh, who've been damaged, and then some longer-term economic development pieces uh, and uh, uh, insurance pieces and others, that some of which you'll see later tonight. Uh, the A3 amendment adds an additional $42,570,000 to the House File 6 portion of the bill to bring the full Promise Act commitment of Minnesota to the impacted areas and, and uh, to the state's economy up to $300 million. And with that, I'd ask for your support. Um, Representative Dabney, do you, uh, are there questions for Representative Dabney? I, I have an, a question or two, Representative Dabney, uh, to your amendment. Um, where, uh, how many, how many more, uh, uh, people might we be able to help with this extra $42 million? You know, Mr. Chair, I, I, I have not gotten a quantification of that. Uh, I think we would be able to uh, provide more opportunity, uh, both for existing entrepreneurs to return to the uh, impacted areas, but also for new entrepreneurs to, to try out their wings uh, and generate more jobs and more wealth. I think it's important to remember that underlying the, the, the police brutality that we saw uh, and that have been plaguing these uh, communities of our communities of color for so long uh, are significant economic disparities, uh, disparities in income, disparities in wealth, disparities in home ownership, uh, and providing opportunities for entrepreneurs to uh, follow their dreams helps to build the wealth and, and close some of the wealth gap, which I think is should be a value and should be a priority. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from members? 
Looks like Representative Kosnick and Representative Haley both have questions. I believe Representative Haley was first. Representative Haley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And to Representative Dabney, the bill author, um, this afternoon, Representative Dabney, I had questions on how the $125 million was determined as an amount. And now this evening, we're adding $42 million to that. And um, I, I appreciate the work that you're trying to do to represent your community, Mr. Dabney. And I, I toured the areas as well and am you know, equally um, outraged at what happened to Mr. Floyd, and we're all trying to wrap our heads around doing the right thing. But I'm also trying to wrap my heads around this bill that's being seems to really being put together literally on the fly from a committee meeting this afternoon to a committee meeting tonight and adding, you know, another 50% to the dollar amount when we have a budget deficit. So how are these numbers determined? Where's the additional 42 million going to come from? And well, I'll let, answer those questions first, and then we can continue. Thank you, Representative Dabney. Mr. Chair, Representative Haley, uh, first let me thank you for coming and touring. We were on the, the tour together, and I appreciated your taking the time and the distance uh, to come see the impact. Uh, that will be part of, I think, larger negotiations than I'm usually allowed uh, to be a part of. <clears throat> uh, but I would remind you that my opening comments today, the city of Minneapolis alone has identified uh, on a preliminary basis, $550 million in damages to buildings. <clears throat> so uh, the, even the 167 million that we're looking at now uh, is, is a, only a, a fraction of that 550 million, and that's only for one of the uh, cities. And Representative Haley. Representative Dabney, does the additional 42 million come from the general fund? Mr. Uh, Chair, Representative Haley, yes. And Representative Dabney, we are gonna face numerous issues related to addressing the problems, um, educational disparities, um, you know, all kinds of things in the, to come from the general fund. And so I'm just trying to prioritize um, how we do all of this in a short time frame when we know we have a significant deficit and we cannot print money like the federal government can. So without figuring out where we're gonna cut, I'm not questioning your need for the money, but how are we going to responsibly come up with the money, Representative Dabney, without knowing where to cut from the budget in order to meet these needs? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Haley, uh, thank you. Uh, the place for that conversation, and it is a conversation that we will be having and will have to have, uh, is the Ways and Means Committee which is the next stop for this bill, uh, and then discussions between the Senate majority, the House majority, and the governor's office, both uh, narrowly in terms of the Promise Act and more broadly, as you uh, indicate, and, and you and I agree, the, the larger budget discussions on how we find our way through this current economic crisis. But the I'd ask you to keep in mind that the impacted areas now have crisis on top of crisis, and we need to respond. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Dabney, I appreciate uh, that. And Representative Dabney, do you see that um, some of these needs could be met um, with the Federal CARES Act money if that legislation that is currently working its way through both the Senate and the House, if that gets passed, that some of these needs could be met by the with that money? Representative Dabney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and Representative Haley, my understanding is not directly no, because the, uh, the civil uh, unrest was not around COVID-19. It was around police brutality and the, the murder of uh, an African-American man. Um, 
Representative Haley, can we uh, do you have other questions? I don't want to cut you off, but I would like to get this amendment on. I know there are Representative Backer, if you have a, um, a, a direct question to this amendment, the extra $42 million. My question, I, um, Chair, my question deals with the whole bill. Okay. So after the amendment. Then we'll, we'll move on here. Unless Representative Haley has a, a uh, something concerning this particular amendment. Um, no, that's fine, Mr. Chair. You can continue with the overall bill. Do we have any other questions? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Kosnick. Yes, um, Representative sorry, Kosnick. I was having an internet connection issue, so I had to log out and uh, luckily was able to- I knew we should have passed this amendment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I apologize to committee. Um, Representative Haley touched on it, but kind of back up for me, I think I kind of missed it, where this extra money is coming from all of a sudden. Is this something that came up? It's coming from the general process? fund. It's coming up, coming from the general fund. Yeah, but did, did this come up? Representative Kosnick, we have a $300 million budget for the Promise Act. They found 500000 extra in their $300 million budget. And they, so put it so here, they put it here in order to get it out onto the streets of City is the St. Paul, Minneapolis, and affected areas as fast as we possibly can. This money is supposed to go out as soon as we pass it. It should be out within two to three weeks, we're hoping. Uh, I guess my question, Mr. Chair, with due respect, is the additional money that we're talking that was added that you alluded to, this uh, a new development that came out since we this committee met earlier this afternoon? Uh, I, I, as the chair, I, I don't really have a good answer for that other than the, uh, the leadership called me and said, you have an extra $42,500,000. Please notify Representative Dabney. Okay, th thank you for that explanation. And I guess I would just comment that uh, Representative Dabney, I mean, if, if we're just putting numbers on paper and we're entering in, I, you know, we, You've identified a need of $550 million for the city of Minneapolis. I don't know what it is for the city of St. Paul, but if you really want to address the need, you, let's just go all out and make it a, a billion dollars or whatever it might be, and then we'll hammer it out through negotiations. Is that an amendment? I'm thinking about it, yes. I, I, it's a legitimate question. I mean, what is the process that we're doing here? It seems like we're slapping uh, ideas together we weren't particularly included in some of this um, forming of these the, this bills and processes, but now we're just adding $42 million within a matter of hours. You know, we've got a little bit of time here. I, I guess I, I'm not happy with the process, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Uh, Representative Dabney, amend, make your amendment and, and go for your whole need. Uh, is that a question for me or for Representative? Representative Dabney, because I can explain where the money came from. I thought I did, but uh, rather quickly, and I can explain it again if you would like. Well, I guess my, my question is to Representative Dabney is, the need is, this isn't meeting the need necessarily. We're doing the best that we thought we could, but I'm also hearing that we might as well just go all out and, and make it the, uh, make it the full, uh, <clears throat> as much of a full bill meet the needs completely. Representative Dabney. I mean, add my, 300, you, add my 300, 300 million into it on top of it and you get a lot closer. Uh, Nick, uh, we have an immediate crisis here and defer and take its time while the needs of Minnesotans are not being met. We can't ever fully assess all of the needs in every sector on our own timeline. We have to start. And when the governor was good enough to visit my district and meet with small, small business people on Lake Street, I told him there were immediate needs that needed to be met to return, start the process of returning Lake Street to the dynamic and diverse 
economy and cultural corridors and uh, everything it was to the city of Minneapolis and to the state of Minnesota. But I also warned him that this isn't a one-time deal. We're gonna be back next year talking again and the year after that and the year after that. As we assess and refine and polish and better understand, this will be a process. We, it's in Minnesota's interest that the impacted communities rebuild and return to vitality as soon as possible. That's not gonna be three weeks or six weeks or six months. It's going to take several years and we need to walk with those communities as a legislature through that process. Um, Representative, let's see, who's next? Representative Robbins? Or no, yes, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was going to wait until we get through all the amendments and then offer my comments and questions if that's why, why don't we do that? Okay, thank you. That? Representative Baker, do you have a comment or a question to, um, to the amendment? Um, I think I can wait till the end as well, Mr. Chair. I think uh, as this thing grows and uh, has other questions, I can wait till the end as well. Thank you. Thank you. Representative, uh, Representative Dabney, seeing no other questions, would you care to renew your motion? Uh, I'd like to re renew my motion that the, for the A A3 amendment to the House File 6 DE1 is amended and ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor of the uh, of the motion as stated, please signify signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? No. No. So, no. Uh, you have your amendment as your, uh, your the amendment passes. Um, we are uh, now on. Staff, which, what, what part of this are we on now? I think we are on the A4. Yes, we're on the A4 from Representative Mecklen. Representative Mecklen, would you care to move your amendment? Yeah, thank you, Chair Mahoney. Yes, I would like to move my amendment, uh, A4 amendment. So literally what this does is this is going to the language of, for the, all those business owners down there, as, as we've heard earlier today and, and other days past, there were several people down there, um, you know, all kinds of folks that had businesses down there and they paid for their insurance up until the COVID thing came in and many of them could not do it once they were shut down. So all this amendment really does is gives them a priority to put them to the front of the line within this bill to literally, for those that did it all right, let's put them to the front of the line and, and let's make sure they're made whole first, right? Because they're the ones that did everything right. They were, they were the good solid business owners. They did it, all the stuff right until they got shut down by conditions they could not control. And I think this is a really good bill. And honestly, um, I, I hope Representative Dabney will, will, will see this as a, a favorable amendment because these folks did everything they could for all these years and they, they should be the the first ones that are protected and, and 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 you know after that you know whatever but but i think this is the the right way to go to protect the folks that did everything right and and, and it's it's folks from all walks of life and god bless them um and i hope you find this a federal amendment i, I really do and it, it, i can't wait to hear the comments thank you um are there any uh questions or comments to the author of the amendment i i think i have one um i want to make sure i say this correctly uh this is immediate needs uh to get some of these businesses open like the barber up on Broadway or the, uh, uh, we didn't really have anyone building 
burnt over there on my side of town, but on, uh, but that would, if your building was burnt down, we're kind of trying to get them step on the first step to getting their building back. So, hmm, I'm I'm a little con I'm a little worried about having to come up with um, all that extra proof. Um, so I'm gonna uh, I, I'm I'm gonna. I'll be voting against this particular amendment, Mr. Chair Mahoney. May I jump yes. in here? Uh, with all the with all due respect, the, 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 the number one goal is to get these people back up and running, right? And and for those that lease property, some of those people don't even have an option because the the, the whoever the landowner is may not give them an option back. We don't even know that yet. We have no idea. But for those that actually can, those that did the right thing and then paid their insurance up until they could not pay it anymore because they were forced to be shut down on account of COVID, why are we not protecting those that did it the right way, the first, it, 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 all the way along? I understand what you're trying to say. This to me is like amazing that if this is all about the Promise Act, those that did it all right, we're not going to give them the promise of what they actually built. I have a really hard time understanding this, and please help me understand it. Um, well, most most of those that had insurance or didn't have ins uh, let their insurance lapse, um, as we heard earlier today from Mita, um, it doesn't cover the whole building because typically these are older buildings, and the value of these older buildings was dramatically lower. So. Um, we can, this bill will provide either $250,000 grant or a $500,000 loan. Um, and if their building was insured for a million and they only got $250,000, they're still not, their new building is going to cost them a million and a half. And as a builder, you should know that. Uh, you, can, you, you can understand that, that particular principle, whether. Um, so I don't think, I think they're gonna end up having to go to the special master that's part of this Promise Act, which can go larger and larger sums than we, than this particular bill will cover. Because uh, a half a million dollars doesn't build a whole lot anymore. Uh, Mr. Chair, with all due respect, if somebody else owns the building and, and, and a tenant is leasing it, they have business insurance, not building insurance. They have insurance for their business. Correct. And the, the, the landowner has insurance on their building. So these are two completely separate things. And, and what I'm trying to do here is protect the business owner that leased or rented a building space um, and, and, and that, that had to, was forced to not pay their insurance on account of COVID. And, and now they, they lost all their inventory, all their shelving, all their everything. This is what I'm trying to protect. And if you're going to tell them you're going to vote against me, that's fine. I, I totally understand. But th this to me is these people put their everything into it. And, and I don't understand because the building owners, they're all going to be fine. They, they, they're, they're, they have much bigger money. And I'm trying to look out for the little people that are actually like put everything they had into this thing. And, and, and I, I don't know, I, I, this, 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 I think they should come first. They were the ones that did it right. And, and on account of the COVID thing that they had no control over, God bless them, but let's like actually help them first. And please help me help them. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments to this amendment? Let's hear from the author of the main bill, Representative oh, Chair. I, I also have one. And Representative Robbins. Sorry, I do have one pertaining to this particular amendment. So I don't know if it's for the amendment author or if it's for Chair Daphne, but this does raise the issue that Representative Haley had raised earlier, that there are COVID-specific harms for these businesses because of the COVID closures. They um, 
either could not pay or let their insurance lapse. And so could, could there be a way to figure out what amount of this can be attributable to COVID and try and use federal money for that piece of it? Thank you. Representative Mecklen or Representative Dabney, would either of you like to take this? Mr. Chair, I've, I'm not familiar enough with uh, all the guidance on the Federal CARES Act. I don't know if it covers uh, businesses that dropped insurance because of lack of revenue because of the impact of the virus on their business. Uh, the, but we also need to recognize that the, uh, the way the am amendment is, is written, if uh, an entity is underinsured, they would be at the back of the line under this amendment. If uh, it doesn't, it, 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 the way it's worded, if a, an entity had their uh, policy canceled, so it didn't lapse, but it was canceled, um, it, it's unclear what happens uh, in that situation, or a party that that for whatever reason didn't have insurance before the the March 13th date, uh, there they would not be eligible for for any support. Um, so we're really picking winners and losers here, in in kind of a random fashion, and I'm not I'm not comfortable with that. Representative Mecklen. Um, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, with all due respect, uh, uh, Representative Dabney, this is about the people who did it right, not those that let it lapse, not those that, that like didn't pay it before, not those that chose to underinsure. And actually, with the it, with, with the inclusion of underinsure, um, insurance agents have the actually errors and omissions policy. So if they do not advise their clients properly to know what they're insured for, then they are on the hook. So we can we could actually help a lot of these people should they have been underinsured, and we can go after it that way as well. So my point is, let's help these people. This this amendment helps all these little people that that have to be helped that are, that just literally got lost everything. And and you know there are big corporations out there, and there are those of us that are just little guys that work long and gals whatever and keep our small businesses and we, we waddle our way through life. So why are we not helping these, these, these folks that, that need it the most right now? And there's clearly gotta be some kind of uh, a way that we can protect them. And I think this is a good way to do it. And, and it literally that there is, there is language out there to protect if they were underinsured, should they have been not told properly by their insurance agent, there is language for that. And then on top of that, if they had to give it up on account of COVID, this is what this amendment does. And I, I encourage you all for your support. And I'm going to ask for a roll call on this one. Representative Backer. Yeah, I'd like to um, comment on this one here briefly. Um, if we don't set priorities, then what are we, re what are we really saying? Well, first of all, we have to hold this event. One of the things after hearing the testimonies this afternoon, I want to correct, this was not a civil unrest to these business owners. This was a criminal act that took their livelihood away. Until we talk about this correctly, we're pushing this underneath the rug. These, these poor business owners, uh, were, were criminals, broke in. They broke in and took their livelihood. They broke in and they burnt down the building. That's arson. It is not civil unrest. And this bill just makes sense. If we don't prioritize something, then we don't mean, we don't stand for anything. So I'm really disturbed when we say, well, um, it'll create more paperwork. Well, no, it really doesn't create more paperwork. These people have shown that their policies cancel. That's not a lot of more paperwork at all. So I'm just challenged when I hear that because 
it sounds to me that we have people grabbing for straws to say, hey, why this isn't a good amendment. As a business owner, this makes completely sense. And I will stand up for the business owners of Minneapolis, even though I'm on the opposite. What I'm hearing right now is we aren't want to stand up for the people who invested their livelihood, had criminals break in, had criminals burn down their building, and you're saying to them, you know what, Pezzacova, uh, that's, we just can't support you. That, that's just ab absurd. So I would ask for support. I could go on for a whole hour on this being a business owner, but I will be respectful other times. This makes sense. It doesn't pick winner or losers. These people have lost. These people have lost because they uh, uh, follow the governor's rule. Oopsie. They follow the governor, they closed down. They didn't have the revenue. They also lost because of poor leadership in Minneapolis to let this stuff go on. These people have lost and lost. And now we are saying, no, we're gonna put you at the back of the line. So this makes sense, it's common sense. The men I would ask for support on this. Any final words, Representative Dabney? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Mecklen said that this wasn't to, for folks who uh, let their insurance lapse, but in fact, the language of the amendment is exactly about folks who let their insurance lapse. Um, we've got in, folks with various amounts of insurance, uh, and you never really know how good your insurance coverage is until you've got a claim. We've got insurance companies that are parsing whether the, uh, shall we diplomatically say, forced removal of store stock was a matter of theft or a matter of looting because the insurance company doesn't want to cover it if they can class it as looting. Uh, I don't think we should be choosing uh, winners and losers. I think we should be working with uh, the small businesses along the impacted areas and working to make sure that they are able to come back whole and energetic and dynamic. And I would ask for a no vote on the A4 amendment. Representative Baker, did you have a uh, Baker? Did you have a question? You know, I did, Mr. Chairman, for maybe Representative Dabney. Um, so, when did the state become an insurance company? You know, what I see here is uh, uh, Representative Mecklen is asking the question about insurance coverage. As a business guy, I cannot get underinsured in my business. They, the insurance company, will say, look, you've got to go up to this point. If not, you know, we aren't going to be able to cover you. So what I heard today in testimony was folks with an insurance company, with a, with a furniture company and other things that uh, had either didn't have enough insurance, underinsured, or didn't have insurance because of what they claimed was COVID. But I will tell you that every insurance company that I called if you called because you didn't have any revenue coming in, they did not drop you because of your inability to pay your premium. My question is to Representative Dabney is, we are now becoming sort of this backup insurance company. And my concern is, is this, and, and as business owners, we're risk takers. I want to help these people. They should have never lost what they did. The city of Minneapolis failed miserably and we heard this in testimony from some of the from some of these businesses that called 911 they called the mayor they called the governor but when did we become this backup insurance company if you don't have to have insurance just just help me with that part of this too if you could mr uh, chair mr chair representative backer uh baker oh Sorry, wrong one. Baker. My no, apologies. That's okay. It's an old joke. It's an old joke. I'm much better than Mr. Backer, but anyway, no, it's okay. Hey, hey, you no, got they... a compliment tonight. Thank him for the compliment. Thank you. Thank you. They did, they did wow. call Representative Dabney, Representative Mahoney earlier, and he, he kind of let it slide. I, I saw that. <laughs> um, you know, we asked government to step in. Um, we passed uh, tens of millions of dollars this year in support for our farmers. 
because they need it. And those bills passed off the House floor uh, near, near unanimously, if not unanimously, from my memory. I think the, the communities along uh, the, in the impacted areas deserve the same consideration from the state of Minnesota. I think and Minnesotans only, deserve equal consideration. I, I, and, and thank you for that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to say that when a farmer doesn't take out crop insurance and it gets wiped out and the banker is saying, you got to take it out, that's a risk that we take. Um, I'm just saying that this is a scary way to legislate in a in a basically a week's amount of time. Numbers are going up quickly in, in three hours. It went up 42 million bucks. And I'm just saying that we have to be very careful here because we all want to re recover this great place in Minneapolis. But my other question is, Mr. Dabney, or Representative Dabney, what is Minneapolis putting in to match this? Are they doing... What are they doing to step up financially to help us? Because um, they had a lot uh, to say about how things played out. Can you tell me what Minneapolis has done or will do to help uh, the state of Minnesota um, uh, cover this up a little bit? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, the city of Minneapolis has been very active on the ground, uh, looking after these businesses, doing the assessment, uh, doing all sorts of uh, looking at, at environmental impacts, looking at all those impacts, looking at and will be, of course, spending money on the public infrastructure, which is their uh, primary responsibility. Um, they've been very engaged, and I imagine will continue to be very engaged. Uh, so there's no. Dollar I, I don't have. I don't have a dollar amount of how okay. much they are there's spending here. All right. Thank you, Representative Back, uh, Baker. Uh, I only know St. Paul's numbers, but I know we're north of $35 million that our city has spent on the coronavirus that is not being reimbursed at this particular time. So our larger cities are who have been dealing with the majority of coronavirus issues uh, have been stretched pretty thin. So there's not a lot of money out there in our city budgets. They will, good or bad, be forced to, in the future, in the near future, find other avenues of money. So, uh, thank you. Representative okay. Hassan, do you have a question? Representative Hassan? I have, I have a general comment, but I'll wait until we're done with the amendments. Um, so, is uh, all the questions have been asked? Can staff take the role? I'm sorry, I'm getting the docu document here. Okay, uh, Representative Mahoney. No. Representative Neuer. No. Representative Gunther. Yes. Representative Backer. Yes. Representative Baker. Yes. Representative Claflin. No. Representative Davney. No. Representative Eklund. No. Representative Haley. Yes. Representative Hassan. No. Representative Kegel. No. Representative no. Kosnick. Kosnick, yes. Representative Mecklen. Yes. Representative Moran. Representative Robbins. Yes. Representative Sundin. No. Representative Stevenson. No. Representative Zhang. No. 
representative. Uh, let's see here. Claflin, was that a no? Please. No. Okay. Thank you. Representative Moran. Mr. Chair, we have 10 no's and seven yeses. Thank you. Are there any other amendments? Seeing none, I will open it up for members' questions. Seeing no right. questions. Rep Jose, you want to go back to Representative Baker or Backer? He was waiting from earlier on. I was trying, <laughs> Representative Backer. <laughs> we were trying here, folks. I want to be out of here by midnight. Yeah, we do too. Um, this is to the author of the bill, um, um, Chair. Um, my question deals with if I'm a small business owner and unfortunately had the destruction and looting and and um, unfortunately the building burnt down that um, was my business. Explain to me the process that I would have to go to to uh, get help from this um, bill that we're working on. Could you walk me through that please? So Mr. Chair, Representative Backer. Uh, you can um, tell Baker, that's okay, it's late at night. <laughs> um, Bad things happen at night, so I'm okay with it. There we go. Um, the House File 6 funds, uh, provides money to deed, which then puts, uses on the ground community organizations with the expertise. Uh, you saw the uh, Metropolitan Coalition of Community Developers uh, testify in favor of the bill today as an example, folks who have that small business experience, who have the relationships, uh, who quite frankly probably helped some of these, many of these small business people get started uh, by having the money go through them, they're able to do the outreach. There's specific requirements in the bill. They do the cultural out, outreach because uh, many of these, uh, many of these small business people are, are immigrants and uh, doing the cultural outreach will be important. Do, doing the technical support while they apply for grants or loans. Grants are only available if a loan is found to be um, not a good fit for that business, depending on, on their full situation and their, their balance sheet. And you work with these community-based organizations that you have relationships with. Follow up. Representative Baker, backer. Okay, and I appreciate the answer. Oh um, my God. <laughs> hey, you got a compliment tonight. I am just I am just so glad that Representative uh Mowry is not still here. No offense to Joe. Yeah. Um I appreciate that, but I was thinking about that. But my my Representative Backer. Baker. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair and um, Chair Davey, um, my question though is this, who do I go to? Is, is there certain paperwork that we're gonna have to fill out? How do we validate that the right people are getting, getting it? You know, unfortunately, my concern right now is that if we don't have specifics set up, it's not gonna to get to the right people. What it sounds from what you just shared with us is, well, if you have the right relationships, you're going to get the money, but I I got a burnt down building. I don't know where to start. Where where do I start? You know, hopefully we don't go. It's through deed, so good news it won't go through the city of Minneapolis. But do we? Um, who do we contact? What paperwork do we have to fill out to validate? Because we want you. You're going to have to validate if they were insured and. If they, if the, because a lot of these buildings, the land, the owner who owns the building is not the business owner because they're leasing it. Walk me through how, how, 
how do we go and verify that the right people are getting in and that the people who need it get it instead of the people who know the system and have the relationships are getting them. We want to get it to the people, the businesses that are really needing it. So, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Baxter, yeah. I, I would uh, direct you to uh, page two, line one, perhaps, and, and below from there, where the community organization must develop criteria, procedures, and requirements for determining el eligibility for assistance, uh, for uh, duration, terms, underwriting, and security requirements, which I think goes to many of your concerns about uh, deserving and re repayment requirements for loans, awarding of assistance, administering the grant and loan programs. Uh, the community organization then must uh, submit its criteria, procedures, and requirements developed pursuant to that clause to the Commissioner of, of Deed for his review, uh, and the Commissioner much, must approve those. Um, so it's it's a an elaborate uh, process to make sure that everybody has all their ducks in a row, that it's overseen by the commissioner, that the cultural and other forms of outreach are done so that it's not a matter of who knows who, it's a matter we're coming to provide you with assistance. Do you need the help? And these organizations know these people, they're on the streets, they're on the ground with these people already. Just one last comment, Chair, if I may. Certainly. I, I appreciate you sharing that. I, I'm still very concerned that we're not, because this is being put together so quick, that um, the people who need it the most may not get it. That's why we go through the various processes and put that together quickly. So that is my greatest concern. I think you and I have the same um, outcome helping the people who need it most. I come from a business perspective um, and um, you know, I've not been able to, outside of just speaking here tonight, that really included in this whole process. I think we need to have more business owners involved instead of organizational, because running an organization is different than being a business owner. So with that said, that, I, that will be my last comments. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Representative Cosme. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Dabney, I just had a, some questions on, on the, the program in general. You, uh, Representative Backer had mentioned it a little bit, but um, how are we, I have a concern that the criteria that the commissioner will approve uh, is set by community organizations, but can you clarify for me, is each, the different community organizations, are they allowed to have different criteria for determining who gets a loan and who gets a grant or, or who gets any of these funds? Because that's kind of the way I'm reading it. So there's different community organizations that will administer these funds, uh, but it looks to me like they may have uh, different guidelines. And I'm wondering, Mr. Representative Dabney, why aren't we more specific on the guidelines to get uh, funding in, in a loan or a grant here? Why aren't we more prescriptive of, of what requirements we want of these businesses? Now we're up to 300 million, I think, uh, or 167, whatever it was mm -hmm. that with your A3 amendment. Um, so, you know, significant amount of money is starting to pile up here. Uh, and I think we need uniformed um, criteria so that these businesses does uh, have an even chance of getting uh, funding on the, on the same level across the board, whether they go to uh, one community organization or another, because my concern is somebody will um, have lower standards. I used to be in banking and, and loan approvals, would have lower standards than somebody else, and um, I'm not sure that's the outcome that you're looking for. Can you clarify uh, those standards for me, please? Ms. Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Kosnick, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think we share the same goal that businesses and nonprofits, because this is also available to nonprofits. We had Goodwill Easter Seals before the committee this afternoon, um, have equal access. Uh, I think where you and I disagree is I don't think all wisdom resides in St. Paul. Uh, we're a smart bunch around this uh, metaphorical now table 
uh, but I don't think we know everything. And that's where you and I disagree. I don't think this should be driven by St. Paul. I think this should be driven by uh, folks on the ground, by the business owners who brought forward the concerns and the needs that they identified as we walked the streets of the impacted areas and that they should be engaged. And then with the Department of uh, Employment and Economic Development, the folks who do this work for the state involved in evaluating the criteria to make sure that it's as uniform as possible and uh, has the rigor that we would all want it to be. Well, Representative to Dabney, I, I would disagree that we do actually agree on two things. One is that there is a need for the relief in these areas, we share that. But I also agree with you, uh, we don't have all the answers here as legislators, uh, but I think there are smart enough people and if we took the time, uh, we could have an appropriate uh, criteria put in to the legislation uh, with the folks that you mentioned at DEED and the other organizations, if we took the time to establish those requirements now, I think it would serve us better. It would serve your constituents and the, the businesses that we're intending to help. It would serve them better if we laid it out more clearly from the get-go. And I, I can just see some unintended consequences and some unfairness and resulting uh, without having to be prescriptive a little tighter than what it is here. And so that's a concern of mine, and, and we can just leave it at that for now, but uh, that would be uh, a concern of mine why I'm not uh, voting in favor of this bill tonight. Um, I had another thought that we should be trying to leverage private funding along with the state funding, and I don't see that in, in here. If you could comment on that, and then maybe uh, the last thing I think was uh, provide a little more context because I wasn't clear or I, I, I didn't hear a very cohesive reason of why some people may be determined to get a grant while others would be required to pay it back uh, via a loan and what those terms would be. Because certainly um, if you're there's a loan and you're expected to pay it back as a business owner, um, that's fine, that's the way the world works. Uh, but if another business or type of business is getting a grant, and not expecting to uh, pay it back. It's just essentially free money. Um, I think I, I want to understand what the difference is and how that will be determined. And then also if you could just comment the, that there's no private funding requirement in this to further leverage the state's um, contributions here. Because I think those are two important things that are missing. And I think that's the end of my questions, Mr. Chair. So I'll just uh, leave it to the author to answer those if you would. Mr. Chair, Representative Kosnick, thank you for that. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I, I fully understand your question about private funding. Um, of course, these business people will have to put their own money in, and, and whether it's, it's directly or through loans, uh, these loans or other loans, um, they as, as well as their sweat equity, as you understand. Uh, in addition, so I'm not sure if that's the question you're answering or you're asking. In addition, Mayor Fry has established a, a group, Minneapolis Forward, to coordinate uh, the public and private uh, funding that is available to help rebuild the city. So there is a separate mechanism outside of this bill for helping to coordinate public-private partnerships uh, in the city of Minneapolis. I'm not familiar uh, with what might be going on in the city of St. Paul along that line um, or the other impacted areas. I think there was some of West St. Paul and some of Brooklyn Center that were also impacted. And I'm just not familiar with, with those situations. Uh, as to your uh, question about loans versus grants, if you go to uh, page two, lines 19 through 21, loans to entities with or without interest and deferred or forgivable loans. So yes, it, it, you know, a grant is in any situation better than a, a loan, but a forgivable loan is much the same in terms of the impact. Uh, the maximum loan uh, is capped at 500,000. The lending criteria um, specify that, well, that I lost track of here. So I'm sorry, 2.16 to 2.18. Grants to entities. These grants are not to exceed $250,000. Grants may be awarded to applicants only when a community organization determines, using the criteria approved by the Commissioner of Deed, 
uh, determines that a loan is not appropriate to address the needs of the applicant. Uh, as we've talked repeatedly, this is a crisis on top of a crisis. Uh, some of these businesses were quite stressed by the COVID-19 virus and its impact on their business. Some of them don't have space in their spreadsheet for a loan, uh, but want to get back up on their feet and a grant could provide that. And I, I thank you for that, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Davney. I guess my point is, is that it's not spelled out in the language. So it seems a little bit more arbitrary to the community organization that will be distributing the fund a lot more arbitrary who gets grants and who gets loans. Um, so I, I think that needs to be tightened up as we, we move forward. Um, well, Representative Kosnick, no, as, no. as I Re said. Representative this... Dabney, let me finish with this one. Representative oh. Kosnick, we have done loans and grants without any more uh, prescriptiveness in many, many instances. We can go back to when we had a flood down in southeastern Minnesota. We did grants and we did loans and we did, we allowed deed the ability to set parameters, which we are doing here in this particular bill. The community organizations do not in any way, shape or form get to just lollygog along with whatever they wanna put on their parameters. They have to go to deed, they have to go to the bankers. Most of these funds are gonna go through the community, uh, the entrepreneurial fund lenders. So they are bankers also. They're not gonna make stupid decisions. And in one of these particular instances, and the big one, there's a sub substantial Muslim community on, on Lake Street that cannot pay interest, cannot do loans. So that is one of the biggest, bigger reasons that had, we had to put in grants. I hope that answers your question. Now we're gonna go, because we now have six people on here looking for questions. We've been going after this for an hour I said we are not going to, we can't meet past midnight. So we are now going to go to Robbins that has questions. Well, Mr. Chair, if I could just interject, and I, I understand your frustration, and I, that's not my intention. Because it uh, certainly seems like the plow has gotten put down. Uh, go ahead. I, 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 I just, I, I recognize your frustration, prerogative of the minority to. Uh, be able to debate according to Masons and legislative process. Um, and so that, that there is no plow that's being dropped. Uh, we would, I would come up with more silly things to talk about, but uh, uh, I do respect uh, the committee's time and, and it was a legitimate question. So uh, I apologize for your frustration for you, but um, I appreciate the answers. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. I. Um, I, I do have a lot of questions. I don't want to belabor this. I have no intention of dropping the plow. I'm sure like all of you, I have other things I would also like to accomplish tonight. Um, but this is really a big deal to my mind. And Chair Dabney, I was in your district, Representative Hassan, Representative Gomez. I went uh, to St. Paul on one of the tours. It's devastating. And I talked to those business owners. It's heartbreaking. And I care about these communities. I care about these businesses. I, as some of you know, I've been involved in a nonprofit in the Phillips neighborhood for almost 20 years. And I have seen the positive changes in these Did neighborhoods. You get you the Sorry, Did yes, you... I have a ton. Anyway, I just want you to know, I care about this. I'm with you, but I, I just, I'm crazy about this bill, honestly. Um, so, so I'll try and ask my questions quickly. So in lines 1.9 and uh, 1.10, why are the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul allowed to qualify as community organizations? What's that about? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Robbins, because uh, they are experiencing significant expenses. They have very active, both cities have very active economic development offices that are uh, very engaged with local entrepreneurs and they're able to provide uh, assistance uh, in doing so. So, so thank you, Mr. Chair. So they will be able to be some of the groups as a city that would give out these grants. Am I understanding that? That would be my understanding, Mr. Chair and Representative Robbins, yes. Okay, thank you. And, and to the point on 1.12 where it says nonprofit organizations, 
is that all types of nonprofits or is that just C3s? Does it also mean C4s, C6s? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Robbins, I would understand that to mean C3s. Okay. Thank you. Um, sorry. Um, I have so many questions. I may follow up with you separately, Chair Dabney, because I really would like to see a package that we can all get behind. Honestly, I really do. And I'm not here yet. I'm not there yet. But one of my concerns, which is sort of what Representative Kosnick raised, is that that we're giving this to Deed, who's going to create a new program. And then all these community organizations are going to create their own individual criteria and run their own mini programs, which do have to be approved by Deed. Do you have any idea how many nonprofits qualify for this? How many individual community organizations this might be that Dean might have to approve these into individual plans? That would that, Mr. Chair, Representative Robbins, I would understand that that would be up to Deed. I think we need to recognize that Deed has significant expertise, but uh, reasonably does not have the on the ground relationships uh, as as uh, intimately as the uh, metropolitan community uh, development folks do, who've already been working with the, many of these businesses. Right, so and it's, I it's a hand-in-hand -hand sort of approach. Mr. Chair, thank you, Chair Dabney, and I can appreciate that, but it, it does concern me that there could be a very large number of nonprofits, each with their own criteria, each with their own plan, and then my next question is, can a single business go to different community organizations and get different grants and loans so that multiple community organizations are funneling money to the same business? Uh, well, no, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative Robbins, uh, they're going to be looking at the, at, at the books of the organization. And certainly it would make no sense under any criteria for a business to take out multiple different loans that exceeded any uh, capacity that it had to pay those back. No, uh, this is going to be uh, dealt with as by bankers, as Chair Mahoney uh, spoke to, and they're going to be looking and doing their due diligence. Thank you. But there's nothing prohibiting two different community organizations from giving grants or loans to that same individual business. Uh, aside from but, Representative, Representative Robbins, aside from maybe a fraud charge, no. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, oh, so I'll I'll save my other questions, but Chair Dabney, perhaps I could have a call with you because I I do want to find a way to do this. But one of the things that was frustrating to me working on the small business grant program and other things related to the COVID issue is that Deed said clearly they did not have a time or staff to approve multiple um, business plans for safely reopening. They clearly did not want that. And so this to me looks like a lot of work for Deed to go ahead and approve these individual programs and I, individual applications and criteria. And I just think having a uniform application, having a uniform standard would help all your businesses get the money sooner, which is what we're all about. If if there's multiple applications and multiple venues and so many layers, I just, I'm very concerned that this is not the most efficient. And and I'm sorry, but one more question. I, The special master panel, how are these two things gonna work together or do they not? Because I heard the special master panel bill earlier today in judiciary committee, and I have some concerns with that bill, but that honestly seems like a more streamlined approach. So I'm just wondering, why do we need both? Representative Mr. Mr. Chair, Representative Robbins, I you actually have probably more uh, fine-grained understanding of the special master panel than, than I do because I've not sat through a committee hearing on it. Uh, this is intended on immediate uh, needs and immediate resources for businesses to get uh, stood back up. The special master panel comes in months, six to nine months later, and obviously, uh, just as under the 35W Bridge Special Master Panel, anything, any insurance settlements that people received was netted out of whatever they were eligible for. 
I would expect that same process to happen here where a special master, if you went before the special master panel, any compensation or support you've previously received would be netted out. Right, and I, I would also hope that would be true of this program because it seems to me from talking to different businesses I've talked to, many of them are getting insurance. And so I think until we sort of sort all that out, it's hard to know what the need really is. And Mr. Chair, Representative Robbins, that would go to the criteria that the uh, organizations would develop and that would be signed off by deed. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for answering all my questions. And I think the final person on the list is Representative Backer. No, Baker. Sorry about that. <laughs> you know, Chair Mahoney, you're getting funny now at the end of this deal. Um, uh, I, I, I think I'm actually going to wrap it up because I think my comments were more, um, you know, Chair Mahoney, you've worked so hard to, to work on this wage theft bill. And as a business guy, I'll tell you what frustrates me is when uh, businesses cut corners they shouldn't cut. And I asked the question earlier about insurance. Insurance is an important part of running a business. And I wanna go back to, to Representative Mecklin's comments about, we need to make sure that the folks who were trying to pay their insurance bill and the folks that even had paid up their uh, insurance premium in January and February before COVID hit us, those folks still have a claim. Um, but I worry about the people that were saying that they were underinsured or not insured for whatever reason. But insurance is like paying your wages to your employees. If you want to start cutting corners in a business, that's not one way to do it. And as a business guy that have been doing this for 25 years, that is not where you do it. I, I, I'm having a harder time with this bill as it moves along. And I think we just have to be very careful that we want to help the people that were, that were really working hard legitimate business owners that were paying what everybody else is supposed to pay to be a real business owner and a, 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 a person that's paying their taxes and everything else. I remember clearly the, the uh, furniture store owner who was paying his taxes and all those things and his, his, his business got destroyed. I, my heart bleeds for them. And I think when I heard others are not that they're underinsured. That means that they were not any insurance because insurance companies don't cover people, businesses underinsured. They don't do it. They will drop you like a rock. So I just, as this thing moves forward, we have to be ready to be real business owners. You can't be half in on this because Chair Mahoney, you told me you can't be a real, you can't be a real employer if you're not doing it the right way. Because I am angry as a hornet when I have business owners that are paying employees cash under the table and doing it wrong. I'm with you there. But part of this is the insurance part too. Insurance should be covering so much of this. They got out of the COVID thing so easily. This business loss insurance is, is so frustrating for me. Anyway, so I know it's late. You want to get going. We can have more conversation on the house floor when this thing goes along. This thing has got more work to do, but I'm a business guy and I wanna hold everybody to the same standard that I'm, hold, that I'm held to. And um, this bill keeps getting more expensive. And I don't know that that's right when people didn't have the insurance and the proper planning in place that uh, anybody should know when you're in business that has is part of the deal. So. Um, let's see where this goes. This is going to be a long, bumpy week ahead of us. Um, we want to help our friends and our neighbors in Minneapolis and St. Paul. This bill has a lot of issues and I want to work on this, but, um, just want to make that statement. We've got to make sure they're all held accountable, Mr. Chair. And, uh, that's what I wanted to say tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I did not put hate represent Haley on the list, but the staff, my sharp staff did remind me. Representative Haley had a question. Uh, Mr. Chair, I can hold my comments till the, the end of the evening. Thank you. Well, we we one well okay. Thank you. Uh, 
Representative Dabney, uh, the questions have been answered, I mean asked, answered to the best of our ability. Um, is there, some other people had said they wanted to speak before the vote. I think Representative Hassan, did you have a comment? No, I'll pass. Are there any other comments to be made? Then the author of the bill has the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members, for this uh, vigorous debate and discussion. Uh, steel sharpens steel, so hopefully this uh, process strengthens the bill going forward. I also want to thank uh, all the members from both parties who've come and toured uh, the impacted areas, whether you were walking Lake Street or Broadway or University Avenue uh, or the environs around those. Uh, very much appreciated uh, by myself and my colleagues in the delegations, as well as the business people and my communities to, to see you on the ground. Uh, what politics and politicians do best is delay. And we don't have time for that. We don't have time uh, for this support to businesses and communities to be able to stand up. We don't have time to delay on police reform to make sure that we have a police force uh, across the state that uh, is transparent and accountable and responsible. We don't have time to delay on making sure that we tackle the issues of uh, racial disparities and inequalities that we've allowed to fester far too long in this state. I ask for your yes vote. Thank you. If you no other comments, the clerk will take the roll. Okay. Representative Mahoney. Have a yes. Yeah. Representative Newer. Yes. Representative Gunther. Pass. Representative Backer. No. Representative Baker. No. Representative Claflin. Yes. Gunther can vote anyway. Probably come back. Good. Representative. Davney. Aye. Representative Eklund. Yes. Representative Haley. No. Representative Hassan. Absolutely, yes. Representative Cagle. Yes. Representative Kosnick. Kosnick, no. Representative Meckland. No. Representative Moran. Yes. Representative Robbins. No. Representative Sundin. Yes. Representative Stevenson. Yes. Representative Zhang. Yes. Representative Claflin. Thank you. Mr. Chair, we have 11 yeses, six or seven, no, six, abs, six no's and one abstain. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Zabby. Thank you, members. Uh, we'll now move. Mr. Chair, sorry. Do we want to, I believe Representative Gunther passed. I don't believe it was, does he want the CLA to come back to him to try and vote? Gunther votes no. Thank you. We have seven no's and 11 yeses, Mr. Chair. You're on your way, Rep Representative Dabney. Representative Lee, you have your House File 86. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, committee for the opportunity to uh, present House File 86. I would appreciate it if you move it before the committee. So move. Uh, I will move your bill, Representative Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do have three amendments. I uh, just wanted to ask for your direction. Can we take up the three uh, amendments first to get in the shape that I uh, want before? I do want to acknowledge that there are two testifiers on the call, too. Go right ahead and take up your amendments. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so the first amendment that I would like to uh, have the committee consider is the uh, A4 amendment. I'll move your A4 amendment. Uh, thank Please you, Mr. Explain. Chair. So the A4 amendment uh, takes out the tax provision in the bill that will be addressed tomorrow morning in the tax committee. And so uh, for our members to know, it's uh, deleting section, page one, section one, uh, page two, uh, section two, and then uh, page seven, section six. That's the finance and the uh, bonding piece, Mr. Chair. Are there any comments or questions? All in favor of the A4 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. We've adopted your amendment. What's, which amendment did you want to take up next? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like for you to consider the um, A5 amendment. So moved. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee, so the A5 really gets to the purpose of why we are creating this uh, corporation and structuring the board with only people of color, indigenous people, and why grants uh, go only to organizations led by, primary, led by and primarily made up of people of color, indigenous people. Uh, the amendment acknowledges that there are adverse impacts of past and ongoing racial discrimination in the metropolitan area in all areas of life, including economic and small business development, health, education, and housing on our communities of color and for indigenous people. And so uh, we wanted to put this in as a purpose as to why we want to uh, create this. And Mr. Chair, I would like to uh, ask for your support. Are there any questions or comments? Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A5 signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. You have the A5 amendment as, as you asked. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so the next amendment I will uh, like for you to consider is the A2 amendment. Um, I will move the A2 amendment. You Thank you, Mr. It? Chair. So the A2 amendment uh, in the original bill, we uh, have an executive director for the corporation. And after hearing some concerns from the public facility authorities, which we listed in the bill, uh, we wanted to move that away from, from them and actually have uh, the board that will be created from this authority to hire an executive director to lead the corporation. But in the meantime, the commissioner or deed or his designee will be serving in that capacity. Are there any questions or concerns? Any questions or concerns? All those in favor of the A2 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 All those aye. opposed? You have the bill in the shape that you would like. Um, did you, did Representative Kozniak want to take your take up his amendment now, or would you prefer to have the two testifiers? Uh, so Mr. Chair, I, you know, I uh, will consider the uh, uh, portion of the uh, Kosnick amendment as a friendly amendment. So if uh, Representative Kosnick wants to offer it right now, I'm fine with taking that right now. Representative Kosnick. Um, yeah, if I could have staff um, clarify for me, because I think that we were switching a couple of the amendments and I was, um, receiving some other messages here on, on the ones. Um, did we take up the amendment with from uh, the author removing the sales tax increase? Representative, uh, Representative uh, Lee. Uh, that is my understanding, Mr. Chair. If uh, Ms. Dice is on the call, she could. Uh... Um, Mr. Ms. Chair. Dice. Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Kosnick, your, over, your amendment, the um, A6, overlaps with uh, one of the ones that was just adopted by the committee, the, um, I think it was the A4, that, but uh, your amendment it has one part that has not been taken care of, and that's the deletion of Section 7, which is the expiration date for this corporation under the Bill as it is right now, the corporation would expire in 10 years. Your amendment would delete that and leave it as a permanent body. So that would be in the A6 amendment on line three, where it says page seven, delete section six and seven. Section six is already gone. 
and will be addressed in taxes tomorrow, but section seven is still in the bill. And that would be, as I understand it, what you would be moving is to delete section seven. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, thank yeah. you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess I, my original um, strong concern was the establishment of additional taxes on constituencies well outside of the, the affected areas that we were previously talking about that I, I think um, doesn't necessarily tie in with, with this particular bill's intent, but um, the residents that I serve in Dakota County uh, had been in a previous joint powers uh, on a transportation improvement board uh, that certainly did not um, work out very well for our constituents, for our taxpayers. And I, so I had strong reservations about that. I appreciate that um, it has now become a better thought to not have tax increases. You know, with uh, the record unemployment claims well over 700, I think maybe even over 750,000 uh, people uh, filing for un unemployment, uh, raising taxes on Anoka, Dakota, Scott, Carver, and Washington County residents um, is probably the last thing that those residents need. It's probably the last thing that uh, Minnesotans need uh, as we try to get this economy restarted uh, as we work through these crises. Um, so I will just withdraw the amendment because uh, I'm comfortable with having an expiration date. If I would have had more time and, uh, to think this uh, bill through, I'd probably uh, have a shorter uh, duration time on this. Uh, but uh, So I'll just withdraw the amendment. Um, and I'm glad to see that the better thought has come through and, and you've decided not to um, reconsider your, your ideas about raising taxes on uh, Minnesotans. So, Mr. Mr. Chair, I withdraw the amendment. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, Representative Lee. So, I would uh, ask the committee to consider uh, the, the portion of the uh, Cosmic Amendment that was not, uh, that was withdrawn, uh, eliminating the uh, expiration date. I believe that, you know, we have an opportunity here uh, to really address some of the uh, disparities that we are seeing we are seeing in our communities throughout the seven county metropolitan area you know for our communities of color and indigenous communities and so uh, i will ask the committee to consider um, uh, the elimination of the uh, expiration please are there any comments or, or questions about that um, well i <laughs> this is going to be a voice vote so I, I will uh, express my, uh, my happiness when we put expiration dates on and force people to come back and, and um, prove their worth. But having said that, I will move the uh, A6 amendment, what's left of it. Uh, I, I think, do I, do we represent, um, Ms. Dyson, do I have to do anything with that amendment to just focus in on the Article 7? Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't think so. Um, it's, well. Because it is the I, last I think, it, I think it's on, yeah, it, it, the other part has already been adopted, but um, so if you wanted to modify the amendment, it would be to, on uh, the A6 amendment line 1.2, delete that line on 1.3, uh, change it so it reads, it reads page seven, delete section seven. Uh, Ms. Shalene, do you have that? Oh, I can. Well, you can make sure that that yeah. gets done? Yeah, that'll be so taken we'll, care of. We'll move Representative Lee's, uh, or Representative Kosnick's A6 as stated by uh, Ms. Dyson, and we'll allow you to, so I will move that amendment um, and allow the revisor and staff to write it in that particular fashion. And, and to clarify, Mr. Chair, if I may. Sure. You are offering the A6 amendment. I am not. That is correct. 
Thank you. All those, in, uh, uh, any comments or concerns? Hearing none. <laughs> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 So we have the bill in the fashion that Representative uh, Lee would like. Uh, yes. You didn't ask for no votes. Oh, I'm sorry. No vote. All those opposed? No. No. Uh, OK. So now we have it in shape. OK, I'm making sure that no one has asked for that I didn't miss anybody here. Uh, Representative Lee, you have two testifiers. Uh, I have one here, of Amy Thor. Thank you, Chair Mahoney and members of the committee. Um, Amen. Yeah. Chair Mahoney, that's the second time today you're trying to get my name correct. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to help you with that. Uh, you see more of me. You know, um, I, 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 I got a ton <laughs> of grief from a few people from that's this afternoon still. So. Um, and I'm an East Sider, so I run to you all the time. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Mahoney and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Bob Meng Paul. I'm with the Asian Economic Development Association. Our offices are on University Avenue in St. Paul, and uh, we provide small business development services to Asian uh, immigrant and low-income individuals in the metro area and beyond. Um, I'm just going to read a couple of things here. The Minnesota Paradox, How Race Divides Properous Minneapolis. Minneapolis ranks near the bottom for racial equity. Racial inequity in Minnesota is among the worst in the nation. Minnesota is prop prosperous, but has deep racial disparities. Minnesota number four in child well-being, but among worst in racial disparities. Minnesota has some of the worst racial disparities in the nation. I, I read that already, I think. It sounds the same thing. How did Minnesota become one of the most racially inequ inequitable states? Now, these are all headlines in local, national, and international media. You, I mean, you, I'm sure you've seen some of these. Um, and it's, it's hard to ignore them when you see these things. And uh, to be honest, they, they bug the hell out of me uh, because I, I, I love my state so much. It makes me sad. I have a lot of pride for Minnesota. So headlines like this, you know, they're, um, I, I hate them. Um, they make me feel really bad. Um, um, so um, Mr. Chair, a member of the committees tonight, I'm, I'm here to uh, urge all of you to support um, House File 86. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, these headlines are all tied to, I believe, uh, the murder of George Floyd. I, I believe that, and I'm sure some of you believe that as well. Uh, what took place on May 25th, the murder of George Floyd and the ensuing civil unrest, I think speak volumes about the need for House File 86, the establishment of the Metropolitan Area Redevelopment Corporation. This entity will establish the long-term regional means to foster equitable economic development uh, to address the adverse impacts of racial disparities and poverty in our region and our state. Uh, and unfortunately, it took the death of George Floyd for us to be here today and talk about systemic change. Um, but, you know, the urgency of the moment calls for a public regional entity that would lead our region and fix an economic system that is not inclusive and does not provide equal opportunities for everyone. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to point fingers on anybody. No one is to blame. By that, I mean we are all to blame. It's not just an urban issue. It's not just a suburban issue it, or a rural issue. It's, it's, it's not a liberal or conservative issue. I believe in my heart that this is a nonpartisan issue and we're all in it, on it, and we're all part of the solution. We're all to blame, but at the same time, uh, all of us together, we are the solution. Um, I, I, I think in terms of what's going on and what we've seen, um, the racial inequity and racial injustice, 
that resulted in the death of uh, George Floyd. That has festered for a long time. We all know that. And, and, and the death of uh, Mr. Floyd really exploded um, the rage that's been there for a long time. And we have to take that seriously. It's a message for us. Um, um, and, and, and I think if we're smart, we have to address these systemic issues, long-standing systemic issues. If we don't, then we run the risk of repeating history. And in fact, what happened the week of the 25th was a repeat of history, right? Um, so I, I, I wanna say that we're smart enough. We, we know about these issues, but it seems like we, we don't care or we don't take it seriously. Either that or we are not smart and we ran out of ideas um, because these long-standing problems have afflicted our state for 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 a long time. We saw the rage after the murder. We need to focus on it, and we need to understand that the inequities in our communities and our neighborhood is what what killed Mr. Floyd, and we have to take that seriously. We have communities and neighborhoods where this rage has been pent up for generations. These are communities that were locked out of the jobs that provide for good wages and careers that can take care of our families. These are communities that don't get the investments in their neighborhoods from private companies and employers as our um, Minnesota economy grew. These are communities that companies and employers don't want to hire from. These are communities that don't get the housing, the, the quality affordable housing uh, they could own. Wealth creation opportunities have bypassed these communities. Wealth has been extracted in the forms of landlords who don't live in these communities and care for these communities. Wealth has been extracted by companies that get tax breaks and public dollars, and they don't invest back into the community. Local small businesses, that's, you know, I've been on two calls today and we've talked about local small businesses. They're, Many of the ones that are impacted in these neighborhoods, they're undercapitalized. They are, um, they can't protect themselves from, from crisis like what we're experiencing now with COVID-19 and the unrest. They can't protect themselves against displacement and property developers and, and national chains who could come in and be at every corner in our neighborhoods. They are neighborhood businesses left behind by the global economy and decimated by the Amazons of this world. We have to focus on our economically disadvantaged communities and our struggling small business corridors. Locally owned small businesses hire locally. We know that. If you want to drop the un unemployment rate, you know what you can do. You, th you give money to small businesses instead of giving them to uh, uh, corporations because small businesses hire locally. So, um, you know, I want our state and our town to be more equitable. equitable. I don't think anybody, I, I don't think nobody um, does not want that. You know, and I, I don't, I think we've looked at quick fixes uh, for too long. Um, and I, we, we need to look at long-term solutions and look at what works and what isn't working. And I think, House file 86 is a step in the right direction. It's, it's a solution that we should consider. Um, we need to build a local economy that erases the long-standing built-in racial inequities and disparities that gave rise to the rage we saw. We need a public entity working in partnership with communities, local munic municipalities, and private sector employers empowered to raise funding to support our communities that have been excluded and left behind and were Wealth has been extracted. Keep the wealth in the community, bring the investments in. And I think House File 86 could do that, could be the beginning of a long-term solution. So what we saw this past couple of weeks, the rage, it is real, we can't ignore it. It's a voice calling for change. I mean, how can anyone not understand where that all that rage is coming from? So um, I, I wanna urge all of you to support House File 86. Now I have a little question for you. If you don't support it, I ask you, what are you going to do to address the long-standing systemic issues? 
that we have. Now, we, again, we don't want uh, a quick fix, but we want long-term solution to the systemic racial inequities that we know that exist, and that, that, that I know you know exist, so that we don't have to see another week. We don't have to experience another week like the week of March 25th. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Strong words. Uh, Representative Lee, do you have uh, uh, other testifiers? Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe Adair Mosley from Pillsbury United Communities is on the call too. Uh, is there someone from Pillsbury United? It is, thank you. Please announce, uh, identify yourself and, and proceed. Yeah, good evening, um, Chair Mahoney and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Adair Mosley and I have the privilege and honor of serving as the president and CEO of Pillsbury United Communities a 140-year-old community impact organization anchoring its work and ensuring every person has personal, social, and economic power. Um, what I want to share with you all this evening is no matter how you have arrived to this critical juncture, whether you've spent a lifetime on the front lines of social justice or are just beginning to understand the depth of systemic injustices, we are here together and where we go from here matters. The bill before you serves as an equalizer and an opportunity to justly build communities with those that have lived and labored in them. COVID-19 and the deep injustices that have just recently been unearthed that we've been talking about for so long um, highlight what we have all known. We didn't just arrive here. The systems have been systematically perpetuating inequities and excluding black and brown and indigenous communities from economic vitality. And tonight we have a unique opportunity to rebuild a more just and inclusive society. We have an opportunity to live up to our values and the promises we make to every resident of the state. This bill will ensure communities are reimagined with intention and that residents in this great state can live, work, and play near opportunity. This bill can contribute to building generational and community wealth through enterprise development, corridor redevelopment, and quality and affordable housing, to name a few things. You know, as uh, a person that has lived in both rural Minnesota growing up in the St. Charles and Winona area, and now living here on the north side of Minneapolis. I think our communities share the same aspirations. They wanna live near opportunity. And we have an opportunity to do that. All assets every community needs in order to thrive, we can bring it to everyone. So I ask you in this to really think about reimagining the revitalization of our communities. And one of the critical pieces of this bill talks about um, the leaders of it. And I think that that's important. Um, there are companies across the globe that are recognizing that they have systematically and systemically kind of disenfranchised voices at the table. And there's some intentionality with this bill of putting those voices at the table. Those that have the lived experiences need to contribute to rebuilding it and they need to have a final determination in the outcome. This effort will need black, indigenous, and people of color leading, stewarding, and championing this work. So much of how we arrived here has been done without this meaningful engagement in decision-making structure. There are entities like the one I run, Pillsbury, on the ground daily, immersing ourselves in the daily walks of our neighbors and equitably trying to find meaningful solutions. We are prepared to work with an entity like this to be able to do land acquisition, buy and hold strategies, be a community developer, stewarding an end-to-end -end development process from planning all the way through implementation so that we can make sure that these assets are in reach of black, brown, and indigenous people. We are positioned to receive the resources and actualize on the vision articulated here. I believe we don't have to wait. 
I've heard, and, and you know, I'm really hoping that we will be able to suspend the partisan dialogue because we all experience something that I think we all want to wrap our minds around and our hands around in order to move our communities forward. We've been talking and admiring and fetishizing, if you will, the racial disparities, yet we haven't rolled up our sleeves to truly solve the issue. And I want to challenge everyone this evening to think about it, that the, the solution has to be as big as the problem. And we cannot get there through incremental fixes. We are going to need systemic and structural changes. We're going to need policy. And this type of entity helps us get there. And not only do you need policy, but you need the fiscal and regulatory mechanisms that align with that policy. And the development of this Metropolitan Area Redevelopment Council actually starts to put the policy and the fiscal and regulatory mechanisms to help us actualize on that great vision we have for the residents, every resident in this entire state. So I leave you with, there isn't a yesterday to return to, only a tomorrow to resolve. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Nice, good words. Um, members, uh, are, there, uh, are there any questions or, or comments for the author of the bill? Are there any uh, uh, questions or, or concerns? Representative Kosnick has his hand up. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was wondering if the author could comment um, just because things moved a little fast here. So if we don't have the taxing authority uh, included in this any longer, what is the funding mechanism to support this new entity? Did I miss that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Representative Hurry is also on this too. We've been working on this and uh, Representative Hurry will be addressing that issue tomorrow in the tax uh, committee. And so uh, Representative Hurry, if you just want to briefly uh, talk about that and what you are working on, I think that would be helpful for the committee. Representative Hurry. Chair Mahoney, Representative Lee, Representative Kosnick, uh, thank you for the question. Yes, there is a revenue generating component to this. Uh, the sales tax will be imposed on the seven metro counties with a reverse referendum. Representative Kosnick. Okay, but that's not on the bill in the current form, is that correct? If maybe Ms. Dyson could clarify or if the chair knows. It, it, I believe that tax uh, piece was pulled from the bill through one of the amendments. Uh, and one of the comments at the time was that it was gonna be addressed in taxes tomorrow morning. Okay, but then my understanding it's not in the bill today. Okay, but that's the intention. Okay, well, thank you. And then Mr. Chair, if I could just make a couple comments and then I'll go, go on if that's okay with the nope, chair. Go right ahead. Um, just kind of looking at this, uh, you know, one of the big concerns that um, my constituents have um, is with unelected bodies. We've kind of tried to work uh, with trying to reform and restructure uh, the intent of the Met Council and, and their tax and authority. So it <laughs> looks like we're doing a looking to do a reverse referendum that I, I know I read it somewhere else. So, but I saw these amendments flying. I, I um, wasn't sure if it was still on here, but um, so that's a concern for um, my constituents, a concern that I share that there's a uh, tax and authority to unelected officials um, I, that would be sitting a very similar structure in some ways to the, the Met Council. Um, and, and so I just wanna point that out. You don't necessarily need to uh, reply back to that. Uh, another concern, uh, as was mentioned by one of the testifiers, is that the issues that you're intending to alleviate and, and make better uh, are across the whole state, especially in, in some issue, instances, uh, some of the racism issues uh, and sy systemic challenges are even stronger in outstate Minnesota, I would argue, or others would argue. And so that is missing in, in your bill framework here uh, by only having it in the seven county metro area. 
And so I think that's a missed opportunity. Um, not that I, uh, I'm still not in favor of this, this commission or corporation um, because of a couple of the reasons I mentioned, but it, it also doesn't uh, fully encompass what I think would probably need to be done uh, if, if to go with your intentions. Uh, we currently do with the Met Council, they do have some similar uh, aspirations with some of their uh, Livables Community Act that was passed in 1995, um, and uh, especially with the transit oriented development grants uh, to help uh, specific uh, communities uh, to be uh, kind of more wrapped around and and uh, that I think would address some help is is working to address some of these these issues. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about gentrification. Uh, which essentially is rebuilding and increasing the cost of living that pushes lower income people out. Um, I think there's a, an intellectual honesty question when you're actually increasing the sales tax, which increases the cost of goods and services, the cost of business, the new business, the cost of rents, uh, is what happens when we increase the sales tax. And so I, I have a problem. Uh, I don't think that's a, a great method to, to go with. Um, and then kind of the, you know, as I've talked about today, uh, we certainly from members that I've talked to, I uh, wanna be participants and figure out what the state uh, and appropriate response is to address these issues. Uh, we share uh, a desire and uh, an appreciation for the important communities that have been affected. Um, but with this particular bill, Representative uh, Lee, um, well, maybe I should ask you first, uh, have you talked to uh, commissioners at Anoka County, Dakota County, Scott County, Carver County, Washington County? Have you talked to any of those commissioners or, or people from those counties about this? Representative Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, the folks that I have been talking to are the folks that has been in, the impacted in, in my community on the north side. And I know that uh, Representative Kosnick, yourself, and other members, you know, from this committee and from uh, both caucuses have, you know, been out there to talk to, you know, business owner, community members about what, you know, what do we want to see from the, uh, from the state legislature to really help with this recovery. And so, no, I have not talked to those individuals, but I believe that all of us as the residents of Minnesota really want to help address some of these uh, needs that we have here in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and then the surrounding communities too. And, you know, our bill is not specifically just, you know, uh, economic recovery for Minneapolis, St. Paul. We know that there were some damage, you know, similarly to uh, uh, Representative uh, Cagle and Blaine in, in Brooklyn Center, Roseville, West St. Paul. And so this, you know, is not just Minneapolis or St. Paul. This is for the whole uh, region. And so uh, that is why we're bringing this forward because we understand, you know, to your point that, uh, we may have a missed opportunity for Greater Minnesota, but I could probably say this, you know, on behalf of my posse caucus, that we stand readily by to help, you know, address this, you know, racial uh, uh, disparity and you know some of the uh, barriers that we're seeing structurally throughout the state of Minnesota. And I would encourage all of my colleagues in the state of Minnesota to actually get out there and engage with your neighbors, you know, folks who are Black, Brown, and from Indigenous communities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Lee. Um, the other, and the, the, the final point that I wanted to make, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate your indulgence. Um, you know, I've done a lot of work with the um, Minnesota Latino Affairs Council, uh, actually with Chair Mahoney um, as a, my counterpart on that council. Um, and I, I kind of wonder if we're adding another layer of government. Uh, I understand your desire to make it even more specific through this corporation. Um, but I think there's, there's a variety of layers of government um, that are making progress in that. And I, I recognize that for, for many that progress and uh, isn't moving fast enough. And that was, is part of the, the current issue and crisis. Um, but I think as lawmakers, so, you know, we need to take a look at that whole picture. So um, I, I appreciate, you know, what, what your intent is Representative Lee. Uh, I'm disappointed that this is coming so quickly. I know that the Anoka County uh, has told me that they do not support it. And Dakota County has told me that they haven't, um, nobody was contacted with that. And so that's uh, an 
Representative Herr, if you're taking this in the uh, tax committee tomorrow, uh, that's kind of a big deal if you're looking to tax half the state's population without asking asking them uh, about it uh, initially. So um, I can't support this bill um, and I'll leave it at that, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Representative Backer next. Um, thank you, Chair. Representative Lee, um, first question is, is um, what's the main purpose why, why go through this type of uh, setup, a, you know, a, a public corporation? What was the a mindset behind that? Representative Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Becker. You know, you have heard from uh, committee, uh, community members, you know, for Representative Dabney's bill and House File 6 and, you know, the two testifiers that I have here, have here that community members want us to really rethink the way that we look at long-term economic development in our communities. They really want us to center it at the, the, the center of everything, how our communities can lead this discussion and this engagement and be intentional about that. And so that's why we came up with the structure where we're being intentional about bringing community members to the table where they have the opportunity to uh, you know, use their experience and their expertise about what they want in their community to make that decision for them and how and really work towards having a long-term redevelopment and uh, transformational plan in their community. And so that's why we went with this route to really center this on community members so that we can see what we want uh, for the uh, communities here in the metropolitan area. Uh, Representative Backer, did you have further question? Um, yeah, just a, actually a comment and, you know, Representative Lee, I, a lot of the similarities actually in metro area that is in deep rural Minnesota. Um, what I would ask you, and I hear the passion of your testifiers and yourself, but what I have found over my years is, is I would really encourage you to work at creating an atmosphere for economic development through entrepreneurs. Um, I've not found that a government agency has ever been done that very well. Um, that is just not, they can't, it's just not what it's there for. And that's really my biggest concern is that where you're I fully understand where you want your outcome. We know when people are successful, they're willing to take risks or have an atmosphere to take risks. So I really would like to see you guys work with great solar reps on how to eliminate regulations. You know, um, earlier today we had some, um, uh, you know, statements saying that 85% of the economic wealth is developed in the metro area. Well, that's because our our regulations are set to kick the risk takers into North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and other states. I think to find common ground and saying, hey, how can we eliminate regulations? Because that's what puts a thumb on entrepreneurs. Government isn't good at rewarding people for the risk taking and, and, and so forth. So that would be my recommendation. And um, I won't be supporting this because I don't believe government is the best avenue for your outcome. Um, so, but uh, I do appreciate your passion that you have for this. Thank you. Uh, well, I lost my list. Uh, let's just go, let's just do that. Representative Haley, I think you were next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Representative Lee, for all your work on this bill. Um, I don't wanna belabor the point, but just offer a few comments, Representative Lee, as to why I'll be uh, voting no on your proposal. And it's not because I don't support what you're trying to do. Um, before I served in office in the legislature. I was part of uh, an executive director for an education foundation. So the, the educational disparities in the state of Minnesota are a significant concern to me and, and frankly an embarrassment for our state. And I look at all the things that we have tried to do to resolve that. And frankly, we still are not making enough headway. And so I appreciate what you are trying to accomplish but I don't know that this is the right mechanism and I'm concerned about another government entity and I'm 
you don't have to answer this, but again, just the comments of uh, this is rushed. We're trying to do a lot of things to respond to a public outcry for change, you know, that I support and appreciate, but we haven't had the time to um, talk enough and work together on what the right approach is. And I would love to have the time to hear from organizations that really have spent years working on this. Uh, people like the Northside Achievement Zone, the St. Paul Promise Neighborhoods, the St. Paul Foundation, the Minneapolis Foundation, the Summit Academy. I mean, you folks know all those and you've probably toured them and talked to them as much as I have. And I would love to hear from them on what their experience and research and data tells them on what we should do next to address these issues. And I don't fundamentally believe that creating a separate government entity is the right solution to do that. So I, I just wanted to make those comments that I am not denying we have significant issues to address in the state. And I appreciate your efforts but I can't support this bill tonight as the right solution to go about implementing change. Thank you. Representative, Mr. Haley, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I'll be brief. Um, thank you, Representative Lee, for bringing this bill. I just, I, I wanted to understand a couple things about what your intention is. So it looks like, um, the members of this council or this corporation are gonna be appointed by the executive council. And then in addition, cities can appoint a member to join it. So would there be representatives from every city in the seven county area also on this uh, board? Representative Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the appointments will be made from the uh, Executive Council and, uh, you know, the language that we have in there now is that for appointments made uh, up to uh, right now will be for those folks that does live in the city. And so it's not giving the authority for city council members to, to make the appointment. It is up to the Executive Council. And uh, right now we have a requirement that up to uh, December 31st, 2025, that they live in the area that's been designated as uh, by the governor in his executive order uh, number 20-64. And so if you look at uh, section three, uh, the definition of city, page uh, two, line 2.28 to 2.30. Yeah. Okay, but then I was looking at um, on line, uh, looks like it's 5.1 and forgive me if I've missed if this was taken out with an amendment or something, but it says the mayor of each city shall appoint a member of the city council or department head to serve as a liaison. Oh, so it's a, a liaison, not necessarily a full member. So, so that gets to my next question, which is you guys are going to come up with these uh, redevelopment plans. How it, this to me seems like another version of the Met Council. So how do these corporations redevelopment plans sort of interlock with the Met Council 2040 plans and are they binding on all the cities in the seven county area? So can you just talk that through for me? Representative Lee. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, you know, what we're doing here is to really have community members be, be at the point to really determine what is it that we want for our long-term development. And so, you know, we we are providing leeway for the uh, appointed members right here to really come up with the plans that, you know, really incorporate what we have laid out here where they're actually, you know, working with community that that is uh, using a design process of, you know, art and, art and culture, you know, identifying experts and, you know, utilizing community resources to really see what can we do. And so that's why we're using this structure and, you know, uh, outside of the Met Council because we really want this to be a community-driven process. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't see anyone else on the list. Is there anyone else that cares to, has a question for Representative Lee? Any other questions for Representative Lee? 
to go to comments by anyone else? So, Mr. Chair, I had just a couple of questions that I forgot to ask, but, but they're probably more pertinent to the taxing, um, and that would be uh, maybe more of a recommendation to Representative Her and Representative Lee for tomorrow that with the experience of the county's transit improvement board uh, that there should be a process laid out of how funds uh, are going to be uh, distributed uh, throughout the region or the taxing district um, and then also a process that spells out uh, how funds are distributed upon uh, disillusion uh, representative dyson i think uh, would have a pretty good experience on on the C CTIB uh, disillusion process that uh, we worked on and uh, we were ready to do legislative action, but they kind of figured it out themselves uh, just to get it over with. But uh, that would just be my recommendation. That, that doesn't need a comment from the author unless they want to, but um, certainly a major, major concern uh, to a lot of the suburban uh, members that did not participate fully or fairly in that CTIB process. So that, those are my comments that I just wanted to make on the record since I won't be at the tax committee. Thank you. Any other comments? Any other comments? Well, the chair has a couple. Um, these seem, may seem nitpicky, Representative Lee, but on page three, line seven, you have for development of healthcare facilities, uh, and I would highly recommend that you massage that so that some big hospital doesn't come in and try and take all the money. I, I don't have any recommendations for that. I, <clears throat> I would suggest you go to staff on that. And then on line 3.16, you talk about nine members being appointed to the executive council. And then on line, uh, is it 3.22, you lay out the expertise that they have, that four members are supposed to have, but you have six areas of expertise. I, I think you have some kind of a conflict there. Um, uh, it's hard to get all that expertise in, in, in four members. Uh, members, I strongly support this bill. I strongly, I can't say how much. We have examined this problem. We would not be here today if any of all the solutions that we put forth worked. As it is, we've had efforts in the past that have failed so badly. We have one man dead brutally murdered. We have miles of our city that were burnt to the ground. We have lives so disrupted and so discouraged amongst communities of color that they don't try any longer. How can we possibly sleep at night when we have had that many failures that affect that many lives. I've said this a lot lately, we come here to do good work. This may not be perfect work, but it's good work. And if it changes the lives and takes us off the list that say we are the most, we are the metro area with the most, the most disparity between white and people of color. thing I have learned from this last month. As a young man, as a young white man, I did so many things wrong, I easily could have ended up in prison for a long time. But because I was white, the cop told me to get my ass home. He didn't club me with his, 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 his club or his baton, I guess it would be called. He didn't haul my ass off to jail, which probably could have been done. So members, I don't care what council 
what organization, who's been the head of it or who hasn't been represented on it. We as a state, as a region, have failed people from all corners of this state. And we have to stop. And I would say, I would agree that it would be wonderful to have all of these ideas discussed. But I don't think the people of color trust us to actually move on something. It took a death. It took a riot to get our attention. This is a bill that not only should pass, it must pass this year. Representative Lee, you have the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members for this opportunity to present uh, House File 86. And I just want to echo uh, Representative Daphne earlier and thanking all members, you know, for coming out to our districts to really check out, uh, you know, some of the destruction that we have seen in our uh, community. And uh, also just want to say thank you to two of my testifiers who are on the ground, who are working with these community members and businesses, you know, both in North Minneapolis and on the east side and throughout the uh, metropolitan area. And now that, you know, members are back, you know, to your district, back to uh, your home, I just wanna let you know that the trauma of the killing of George Floyd uh, remains deeply felt within my community. And as we work to address a uh, structural racism that this strategy, uh, made this strategy possible in the first uh, place, we must also step up uh, and help ensure our debt valley damage and destroy small businesses have the opportunity to rebuild. And so this bill, you know, is looking not at just, you know, just looking at how we are rebuilding the affected areas and reimagining it. We are addressing the long and historical exclusion of black, brown, and indigenous people from owning assets, uh, generating wealth, and passing it down so that these communities can have generational wealth. So in doing this, we will finally be addressing the root causes of generational poverty, structural racism inherent in how we build and develop, and finally, closing the wealth gap here in Minnesota. Uh, this long-term plan creates a system where people in community, from community, build their community and prosper in that community. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and community uh, member for uh, allowing me to present House File 86. Seeing no further comments, I will renew my motion to pass House File 86 as amended. I believe it goes to taxes. Uh, ways and means. Mr. Chair goes in. The motion is to ways, ways and means. And, yes. To ways and means. Um, so I will renew my motion. The House File 86, as amended, is passed and sent to ways and means. Um, uh, the, clerk will take the, the clerk will take the roll. Representative Mahoney. Aye. Representative Newer. Yes. Representative Gunther. No. Representative Backer. No. Representative Baker. Uh, nope. Representative Claflin. Yes. Representative Davney. Uh, aye. Representative Eklund. Aye. 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 Representative Haley. No. Representative Hassan. Yes and yes. Representative Cagle. Yes. Representative Kosnick. No. Representative Mecklen. No. Representative Moran. Yes. Representative Robbins. No. Representative Sundin. Aye. Aye. Representative Stevenson. Aye. Representative Zhang. Aye. Mr. Chair, we have 11 yeses and seven noes. Representative Lee, you're on your way to Ways and Means. Seeing no other comments, are there any closing comments from anyone? 
see no more business in front of of the committee. Uh, I I adjourn this committee. Thank you.